there any thank you our gathering music was breaths by sweet honey in the rock and the images were provided by our guest minister reverend stephanie if you wish to hear the music again the link is in the order of service that was emailed to you welcome to all i'm rachel daniels i'm your worship associate this morning and we're really fortunate to have back with us Reverend Stephanie, who is going to explore the art of living, reflections on human creativity and resilience. Reverend Stephanie has spent over 20 years weaving together words, music, and ritual as an ordained minister. Reverend Stephanie was infected with Lyme disease in 2015, and as a result, her vision deteriorated significantly necessitating early retirement. When Reverend Stephanie's health improved and her vision returned, she began painting as a way to celebrate the gift of sight. Reverend Stephanie says that painting for her is a form of prayer, a way to transcend the limitations of time and space and to connect deeply with the sacred ground of the present. Most recently, Reverend Stephanie has enjoyed collecting soil from distant beloved places grinding and mixing the soil with linseed oil, and then using that mixture to paint those very places. The striking eye in the announcement about this service is one of Reverend Stephanie's pieces, and later in the service, we'll be treated to many more of her beautiful works of art. Aside from the daily spiritual practice of painting, Reverend Stephanie focuses on offering individual and group spiritual direction sessions, workshops on grief and resilience, private retreats, rituals, and rites of passage. There are links in the e-blast on ways to contact Reverend Stephanie. In Unitarian Universalism, Rachel. we accept you for who and what you are. As stated in our beautiful updated website, it states in Unitarian Universalism, we provide a non-judgmental religious home that will accept and support you wherever you may be in life's journey. It is a safe place to stand out, stand up, and change your mind, particularly during life's transitions. Our only doctrine is love. Our fellowship is currently served by our minister, Reverend Lee Marie, who will remain forever in our hearts, but is leaving our fellowship at the end of this month. Sunday worship is a community effort from the planning the music, the text, the posting on Facebook, the input from the worship committee, our creative speakers, and to all of you for being here. Many thanks to all. After today's service, Reverend Stephanie has agreed to stay for a few moments to answer questions and or talk about whatever is on your mind or heart. And Reverend Stephanie sent some really fun and thought-provoking quotes on creativity that were included in the e-blast and maybe possibly for her to be used in our virtual cafe discussion. So please stick around after the service. Everywhere on Sunday mornings, Unitarians light a chalice. Please grab a candle at home if you have one nearby. Our chalice lighting words are from the UUA website. We light this chalice to brighten our love for each other and shine on our inner peace. We light this chalice to be welcoming to whomever we meet and bring kindness to all living creatures. This is a light of inspiration, hope, and love. And now our call to worship. Thank you, Rachel. I'd like to invite you now to unmute your device as we lift our voices together in holy cacophony for the responsive reading number 437, Let Us Worship. Let's see if we can get that on the screen so that we can share that reading together. I will begin and invite you to give your breath to the words in italics. Let us worship with our eyes and, ears. and fingertips. fingertips. Let, Let us, us love, love the world through heart and mind, mind body, and body. And body. We feed our eyes upon the mystery and revelation in the faces of our 
kindred. We see wistfulness, very young, very young, very old, wistfulness of people in all times of life. Seek to understand the shyness behind arrogance, the fear behind pride, the tenderness behind clumsy strength, and the anguish behind cruelty. Oh, I'm sorry. All life, all life, all life, life flows, flows, flows whoops, with the sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> into a great timeline. If, if we, we will only open our, our eyes, 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 eyes compare to our companion. companion. Mm. So let us worship not in bowing down, not with closed eyes and stopped ears. Let us, let us worship, worship with the opening of the all the windows, windows of our beings and the, with the full outstretching of, of our spirits. Spirit. <clears throat> Life comes with singing and laughter, with tears and confiding, with a rising wave too great to be held in the mind and heart and body to those who have fallen in love with life. Let us worship and let us learn to love. Let us learn to love. love. That intention set, let us bring our attention even more fully to the soundings of the bowl, to the incredible gift of the present moment, which is informed by the past and inspired by visions of the future, those that linger enticingly on the edges of the imagination. So let us breathe together and listen together. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. We're going to sing one of our joyful songs called Turn the World Around. So please join with me at home. i 
Thank you, Kara. That was beautiful. I grew up listening to Harry Belafonte. And this was the music my mom put on to clean house and motivate us, to help her clean, of course. This is, you know, initially I was unsure whether I had anything to add about today's topic because I'm really sad about Reverend Lee Marie leaving and I have a problem with change. <clears throat> Reverend Stephanie suggested that maybe this upcoming change for our fellowship, perhaps we can use it to facilitate our thinking creatively and imagining what's beyond the horizon. And next week, Noreen may have us look at our resilience and creativity with this upcoming challenge. But I do love this topic. You know, I'm not a painter or a sculptor like my husband, and my children are continually impressed with my ability to add a finger or a stranger's head to any photo that I take. And I'm not a musician. I was forced as a child to play the piano and later the flute, but I was never very good. My older brother was an accomplished musician. And because I wasn't that good, I just stopped playing. And anytime I go to a palm reader or a fortune teller, they say I should write. Last week, I saw a documentary movie on Hulu about women writers who are self-publishing and distributing and selling their books, all everything online. They're self-publishing, they're selling, and they're making a really good living. They even quit their regular jobs to make really good money with this self-publishing stuff. And the genre that's selling is romance with a lot of explicit sex. And the storytelling, the storyline, it doesn't even matter. So I'm going, wow, could this be what the palm readers had in mind for me? Well, maybe, I don't know, but I do know that I'm very resourceful, I'm playful, and that helps me manifest my creativity. And so I'm not sure what my next creative endeavor will be. And here we have so many talented members in our fellowship. A few examples, of course, our music director. I'm always in awe of Carol and the exquisiteness, the energy and the emotion that comes alive in her music. Our tech Don recently showed some of his stunning paintings where he captured athletes in motion on his canvases. And this is in addition to his creating art on the computer, being a brilliant photographer. Candy makes works of art to wear. And Candy, like Don, is able to capture the beauty of places and show an otherwise missed view of a place with her camera. Patrick's writing a book and illustrating it. Other members are doing so much. Oakley, a wonderful thinker and writer, and his wife, Linda, is a word magician and improv comedian. I mean, we have so much talent here. Noreen, Donna, Don, and Pam create beautiful worship services that are works of art within themselves. Paul Bogdan makes detailed and clever drawings and is a creative gardener and baker. And so many here are culinary artists from chocolate chip cookies to making complex dishes such as food that Tina's made and that we watch her enviously as she eats it during our Zoom at noon meetings. And I just found out Noreen's also a painter. We saw one that she did of her son and where she creatively handled his mouth with a mask. So, I mean, a lot of talented people here and every one of us has some kind of creativity and so much compassion, kindness and love for our world. And each expression of this love and kindness is an expression of our humanity and a connection to the greater good. Usually, we identify which of the seven UU principles is most emphasized in each Sunday service. Today's program, I think, focuses mostly on our seventh principle. Respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. And I usually think of this, well, I had in the past thought of this principle as the environmental principle. But I looked at the UUA website and it states that our seventh principle is evolving to include and fully embrace something greater than ourselves. The interdependent web is also the spirit of life, the ground of all being, the oneness of all existence, the process of life, the creative force, it is a source of meaning to which we can all dedicate our lives. And this understanding of the seventh principle seems to fit so well with today's service on the art of living. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the service, of course, and to enjoying the displays of Reverend Stephanie's paintings. And now <clears throat> we're going to pause our recording for Joys and Sorrows, even though we're not yet in our building. Thank you. We're now back uh, being recorded. Um, 
And even though we're not in our building, we still have many of the same costs for upkeep and repairs. And uh, Don, thank you for putting together that slide. I mean, the music like that, that was really nice. Um, anyway, this slide shows ways you can donate to the UUFLB. And it's the same information that was sent to you in the notice about this service. So now that um, we have started our recording again, we're back to Reverend Stephanie for our meditation. I love hearing about all the different kinds of creativity that exist in this community. Thank you for sharing that. The imagination is a remarkable thing. It leads to so much creativity, no matter who we are, no matter where we find ourselves. Uh, for example, in a bathroom in Redwood City, California, which is where I am, this is my shower curtain, <laughs> but you can just imagine perhaps that I'm in a forest. All of, all of the places where we might find ourselves have their troubles and their charms. And depending upon the circumstances, they can inspire us to remember or envision times and places far, far away, as well as look more deeply into exactly where we are, perhaps discovering truths not yet noticed. During our time of meditation, I'd like to share with you the result of a creative process that has helped me these past few years, and especially this past year, helped me be more present to the present. It starts with curiosity about the details of the present moment, the, the light and the shadow, the joy and the sorrow. These I have translated onto canvas with paint. And in the process, words very often come to me, words that feel like prayers. And so I call them visual prayers. I hope that they will inspire in you, holy curiosity, for the wonders of each and every place and moment. We begin by bringing our attention to our bodies, to where we are right now, bringing our attention to our breath. And then I will be sharing with you the images I've prepared. Dusk invites us to surrender to the mystery of blurred edges and enveloping darkness. Do not despair. More will surely be revealed. It is possible to root down even on a slippery slope. Go slowly. Keep watch for the beauty of the landscape. Miracles swirl through the air, even now, taking root, growing, and shimmering as if for us to notice. We are all connected.
What do you hold on to? What allows you to remain attentive and engaged when there is so much going on in the world? Know that your journey is witnessed and blessed. It is sacred ground. May you breathe well, may you breathe with gratitude, may you be refreshed and enlivened. And may I figure out how to get off this screen. There we go. So this past year, stuck in the house with few other distractions, aside from painting, I took a deep dive into Judaism drawn in by awareness that in that tradition, each new day starts actually at sunset. I first heard about the distinction between day and night through tellings of the creation story found in Hebrew scripture, the book of Genesis, which was taught in Lutheran Sunday school that I attended as a child. I was taught, and maybe this sounds familiar to you, that God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good and separated the light from the darkness, which was apparently already there. God called the light day, and the darkness was called night. And there was evening, and then there was morning, the first day. I remember really disliking the idea that God should be called a he, and thinking it a bit odd that there was evening and, and then there was morning, that the day started at night. I thought for sure that was an ancient typo, insignificant in the vast scheme of things because no one I knew ever mentioned that take on things. Everyone I knew talked about days as starting at dawn, when the birds start singing, or when you can make out the features of someone's face and, and actually recognize them, when things look increasingly bright and, and colorful and hopeful, and, and when you jump out of bed excited or at least curious to explore the possibilities. But in Judaism, that detail of beginnings seeded when the day lets go into darkness and into unknowing is highlighted each week, particularly on Friday nights, the beginning of the Sabbath. And that intrigued me. It resonated on a deep level because I have come to realize that, that new things do tend to arise only after that which we have taken for granted. The warmth of the sun, for example, dips below the horizon, disappears, and we are plunged into the mystery of unknowing. Now, before I go any further, I need to acknowledge that I just last week learned of Reverend Lee Marie's resignation. 
and that I'm not here to offer you platitudes, to tell you the sun will come out tomorrow, so don't fret, hang in there, it'll all be smooth sailing soon enough. I'm not here to say that to you because I respect you and care for you too much for that. But as it turns out, what I did plan on talking about today, the art of living, reflections on human creativity and resilience, actually has relevance to this development. Now, what I had looked forward to exploring with you today was what the fears, the losses and uncertainties of the pandemic, the vagaries of chance, the mysteries of the sacred and the mundane and the spectrum of human ingenuity have in common. And I hoped to do that by telling you a bit about my spiritual practice of, of keeping watch for the sacred within the everyday and giving expression to what I find through iPhone photography and oil paint and words. I wanted to lead with that part of things because that practice has helped me stay resilient during a pretty tough couple of years, and especially the last one. I'm aware that resilience is something a lot of people are struggling with. As we move into this next phase of figuring out how to get back to some of the things that we've had to put on hold, how to live in spite of an evolving pandemic. There is, I believe, an art to it. A lot of things have been lost and a lot of things have been put on hold, including emotions like grief. More on that in just a bit. So, after sending in my sermon description, I realized I had painted myself into a corner, as if I actually had at the ready the answer to all of these questions. Anyone who's ever looked into these subjects knows they've been hotly debated for millennia. All I knew at the time was that my creative process involves not only being attentive to, to my vision and my imagination, what I already see of beauty in the world with my physical eyes and what I see with my spiritual or ethical eyes, what I yearn to see, but also attentive to the tools and the skills that are needed to, to translate that vision into paint and attentive to the need to learn to, here's the hard part, let go gracefully. All I knew was that even if I managed to find or imagine something remarkable to bring to my blank canvas, I inevitably end up sitting there in front of that blank canvas without a clue as to how to translate that vision, that vision, that vision into something that will please me something that will either feel cathartic as a process or that will be considered worth framing and hanging on a wall. I've found that at some point or other, the creative process does demand that we let go. It demands that we sit in the kind of unknowing that makes it impossible to recognize even for a while, our own features. It demands that we let go and listen. Listen for that which yearns to come to light. Now, some call this listening for the voice of God. Others say it is a way of tapping into our deepest emotions or, or even into the collective unconscious. In any case, then, it's time to let go again. Let go of ego. Let go of inhibition. Surrender to the process of, of heeding that voice and to what actually ends up on the canvas. Chances are it will not bear much of a resemblance to whatever we thought we were setting out to create because life is like that. 
it is surprising. Living and creating are like that. Frustrating, unpredictable, surprising, and yet so very compelling. All of this is where the vagaries of chance come in and the spectrum of human ingenuity. Because so much of what ends up needing to be framed in meaning is the result of chance. <gasps> chance is the name we tend to give to the compounded circumstances we are hard pressed to wrap our minds around. It takes ingenuity to be present to what shows up on the canvas of life. See what I did there? It takes ingenuity to face and trust the seasons and cycles of life and the creative process, which relies so heavily on the willingness to plunge under the horizon of knowing, to let go and not panic. Just breathe and trust that your eyes will adjust and that this is sacred time. There is much to be said for recognizing something of the rising or setting of the sun, the waxing or waning of the moon in ourselves and in our communities. I found that as hard as it may feel, it is important to learn to sit with the discomfort that comes with not being able to see past our fears or sense of helplessness. We may wish <laughs> at times, we may wish to force the sun to rise or the moon to fill out. But the thing is, they will do so in their own time. There is nothing we can do to speed that up. That is one of the few things about life that is predictable. Meanwhile, there is the present, which brings me back to the reality and enormous complexity of grief. This past year, with more than 4 million human lives lost to COVID worldwide, I have found myself wondering where it is the grief, I mean, because I haven't seen the kind of grassroots vigils and memorials that tend to appear when there are natural disasters or plane crashes or fires or shootings, you know, walls plastered with photographs and, and biographies of the dead and, and flowers and candles and teddy bears. I have not seen our leaders guide us into days of mourning, into rituals commemorating who and what has been lost. I have not seen that. Most likely because for a very long time, public gatherings have been prohibited or ill-advised. Most likely because we've all just been treading water, trying to figure out what to believe and, and what to do and how to act and how to adjust. But the thing is, four million suns have set. Four million lights have gone out and this is a new day. There is no going back. It is a new day. In the book of Numbers, in Hebrew scripture, we, we read the story of the previously enslaved Hebrews being led by Moses to the promised land. They deal with all sorts of things along the way. And then Miriam, Moses' beloved sister, dies, and the passage tells us she dies and is buried. And that's that. There's no mention of him or anyone else taking the time to sit with the enormity of that loss, to properly grieve her death. She is buried, and it's business as usual. And then an odd thing happens. Moses, normally so cool and in control, 
loses his temper and he strikes a rock in rage, so very uncharacteristic of him. And then his brother Aaron dies and he really loses it. The floodgates open and his mourning takes three times as long as it normally would because he never grieved Miriam. It takes three times as long to get over the death of Aaron because grief will not be deferred. Not for long, anyway. If we try, it will make itself known down the road in in ways that may be highly uncharacteristic or even troublesome. If we try to suppress our grief, it is gonna show up. You can't sweep it under the carpet because we're gonna trip on it. So why am I telling you this? Because I sat in front of the, the blank canvas of my laptop earlier this week, hoping to write something that would inspire you that would bring your own attentiveness to the, to the sacred within the mundane and find creative ways to express what you find. I looked forward to that. I love that topic. It's become one of my favorites. But then I learned that you as a community have just learned of some big changes. Changes that may make you feel like the sun will never rise again. I am not going to promise that it will. As much as I would normally wish to offer the comfort of an optimistic perspective, I am not going to say that. Because as I sat in front of the blank canvas of my laptop and let go of my plans and listened for what's yearning to be expressed, I found myself moved to paint a sermon in support of grief in support of loss and letting go. And that's what this has become, a sermon in support of finding ways to grieve everything connected to this last year. The death, the fear of illness, the fear of death, the fear of infecting others of vaccines and public places and, and travel, the, the scarcity, the disillusionment, helplessness, and hospitalizations, the despair and anger and distrust, the, the job and housing insecurity, too much or not enough privacy, family separations, loneliness, deferred medical care, disrupted plans, cabin fever, technological learning curve, so, so much. My physical eyes have seen no adequate response to all of these endings of lives and endings of plans and hopes. And my spiritual and ethical eyes recognize that these endings need to be grieved, clearly on their own merits. But I say this to you also because there are, as we now realize, and will always be, other losses ahead. Losses that signal a new day, a new era, the texture of which we cannot yet see. I do not want you as all of that unfolds, whatever that may be, I do not want you to be debilitated by old, unexpressed grief. So no, no platitudes. I leave you with this. Grief cannot and must not be deferred. The art of living which was the original topic for today, is the art of knowing that the past is always carried into the future, whether we want that to be the case or not. So we may as well take the time to acknowledge it and to acknowledge its effects upon us. The art of living is the art of integrating the fact that each ending is also a beginning, but here's the thing, not necessarily 
a bright and colorful beginning, at least not from the get-go. First, it will plunge us into the discomforts of unknowing. And we will struggle for a time to see through it, to adjust. New beginnings can generally not be predicted and most certainly cannot be rushed. There was evening and then there was morning. We are well served in learning to be present to all of what we see with our physical and spiritual and ethical eyes. And in learning to be present to the challenge of letting go and sitting for a time in unknowing. It, it's hard <laughs> and it's so very complicated. My invitation to you, dear ones, is to use these coming weeks to get creative with your grief, which, by the way, may well be tangled up with all sorts of other emotions. Sit in front of the blank canvas of unknowing together and listen and let go and help one another write and sing and paint and dance and cook and build and quilt your stories. Do whatever it takes to express something of all the seasons you have shared together. There is an art to life, just as life itself can be art woven of night and day, darkness and light, create something beautiful to honor the collective vision that brought you all together and that sustained you for so long and that has forever changed you. Do this to honor the ending of one day and the beginning of another whose texture is not yet known and which is therefore shimmering with possibility. May your vision adjust so that you can soon enough start to see that shimmering and then hear the songs of a new day. Blessed be. We'll now have our closing music.
will now extinguish the chalice and carry its light of love, spiritual courage, compassion, and creativity. We'll carry that in our hearts as we're, I guess, entering the dusk and into the dawn. And now to Reverend Stephanie for our benediction. We live in a world in which darkness and light, unknowing and clarity, are woven together in patterns that both delight and confound us. Drawn to the luminous threads, we may underestimate that the falling and rising of both have something worthy to tell us about the relationship between the sacred and the mundane, between fear and hope, and about our ability to move gracefully through spaces in which such distinctions are hazy. May your eyes and hearts behold and your hands give expression to the truth of life's precious, predictably unpredictable beauty and potential. Blessed be. Yeah. Now we'll join our hearts but not our voices for our two closing songs. Please sing along while on mute. Noreen has placed the words into chat for what a wonderful world. And then we'll sing, let there be peace on earth. Hello everyone. Uh, I think we'll all enjoy singing this together. I think this will be a first, but I know we've always loved the song, a wonderful world. <laughs> Thank you.